This edition of the Screen News Digest, a timely motion picture record of the people, places, and events of our times, is presented to you as a public service by the First National Bank of Minneapolis. that corner, how do things look? What a fantastic sight. Beautiful news. Romantic, isn't it? Oh, this is really profound. I'll tell you. It's fantastic. Across the desert and out of the past comes the man whose vision helped to launch Apollo 15 on its journey to the moon. Dr. Robert Hutchings Goddard, father of the space age, is preparing an historic rocket flight on the New Mexico desert in 1930. These remarkable films are Dr. Goddard's own home movies, the living record of a pioneering genius. Dr. Goddard supervises every detail of the desert launch before joining his assistants in the car that carries them a thousand feet to history's first blockhouse. The men scatter and take up their pre-launch positions, following a countdown procedure that will be copied down through the years. The rocket climbs to an altitude of 2,000 feet and reaches a speed of 500 miles an hour, a remarkable achievement signaled by the first of many mushroom clouds to rise over the New Mexico desert. Charles Lindbergh, a staunch supporter of Dr. Goddard and his work, is a frequent visitor to the Pioneer Missile Range. An average of a rocket a month rolls off the assembly line as Dr. Goddard pursues his dream of space exploration. The idea of shooting for the moon, he says, is based on sound physical principles. It can be done. And so he continues to develop and perfect so many space age firsts, including parachute recoveries, that it is impossible even today to design, build, or launch a rocket without infringing on a Goddard patent. A toasted milk marks the end of a successful firing. For 20 years, from the time he launched the world's first liquid propellant rocket, on March 16, 1926, at Auburn, Massachusetts, Robert Hutchings Goddard labors to build bigger, more complex rockets that will fly longer, faster, higher. Through the 1930s and into the 1940s, his research goes largely unnoticed in the United States. But across the Atlantic, scientists in Nazi Germany realize the implications of Dr. Goddard's work with liquid-fueled rockets, learning like he does by trial and error, spectacular error. Dr. Goddard declines all requests from foreign scientists for information on his rocket research, but his basic patents are available to one and all for just 10 cents. And in 1944, when the V-2s are ready for launching against Great Britain, they are constructed from nose to tail in exactly the same manner as Dr. Goddard's New Mexico rockets. There are many historians who believe that the V-2s, had they been perfected earlier, could have won the war for Nazi Germany. After VE Day, Army Ordnance men will question German scientists about their awesome rockets, and they will receive a surprising reply. Why do you ask us these questions, they say. 
Why don't you ask your own rocket pioneer, Dr. Goddard? We learned these things from him. But Dr. Goddard cannot answer. He has died on August 10th, 1945. Falcon Houston, you go for landing. Four, five. Roger, go for landing. Four, four. Base, got a good spot. Contact. Bam. Okay, Houston, the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. Back on Earth, the most remarkable television pictures ever sent from the moon. Astronaut David Scott, mission commander, is first to set foot on the moon. Dave, an extraordinary television picture here. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at, at its greatest. Okay, Dave, I'm going to come on out. What is it? Nice. Astronaut James Irwin joined Scott on the landing site at Hadley Rill. Oh, boy, it's beautiful out here. Reminds me of Sun Valley. The moon explorer's first task is to unload and start up their four-wheeled battery-powered lunar rover, built at an estimated cost of $5 million. The white 10-foot-long vehicle, just visible at the lower right of the screen, circles the Falcon while Scott describes the terrain around the landing site. And the uh, left front's a little low, too. But the limb looks like it's in good shape. The rover's in good shape. Uh, Dave, uh, we read all of that. Uh, we are getting a beautiful picture now. We're going to try to wind up with the tripod in the shade if that's possible, looking back towards the lamp. Yeah, that's, that's possible. We'll do that. Outstanding. Good. This is really a rock and roll ride, isn't it? I've never been on a ride like this before. Oh, boy. I'm glad they got this great suspension system on this thing. Beautiful, Dave. And uh, we stopped. And let's take a gander around and see which way we got ahead. You know, uh, Dave, if we can make it out that far directly ahead of us, look at the large blocks. You know, the antenna's in my way. Okay, that's, that's as good a way as any. We'll hit uh, 140 from here. Okay, Dave, and superb television picture down here. Gathering ore samples, the astronauts drill deeply into the moon's primeval crust during their excursions among the lunar rocks, craters, and rolling hills. NASA officials say this is the greatest scientific exploration we've ever seen in the space program. Gravity is only one-fifth of that on Earth, and Scott must spread eagle himself to generate enough force to drive the drill into the surface. Looking ahead. How about that? Thank you, Dave. We copy all that. One of the interesting things, Jim, is the uh, momentum you generate. Get going and... Uh, There are embarrassing moments too. Scott's fall is the most widely televised tumble in his really soft dirt there around the sure is, uh, like about six inches deep of soft material. That's also like Sun Valley, Jim. Another interesting sight, Houston. I can uh, look straight up and uh, see our good earth back there. Oh, look at the mountains today, Jim, when they're all sunlit. Isn't that beautiful? It really is. <laughs> Golly, that's just super. It's, you know, unreal. 15, this is Houston. Come back. 
In a lighter vein, astronaut Scott carries out a unique scientific experiment, illustrating that a feather and a hammer, dropped at the same time, will hit the moon's surface together. With my left hand, I have a, a feather, and my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago, who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon? And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. And the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather, a falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Well, I'm not that proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. The Apollo 15 astronauts spend some 67 hours on the surface of the moon, carrying out man's most extensive and fruitful explorations of the Earth's mysterious and desolate satellite planet. During three excursions in their lunar rover, Scott and Irwin remain outside the Falcon for 18 and a half hours, traveling more than 17 and a half miles. The moon mission, carried out at a cost of some $450 million, is ending with only two more lunar flights scheduled in the Apollo project. Stand by, Dave, for me. Okay. Give me a word. Anytime. Jim, close the hatch. Okay, loud and clear, Dave, and your go for liftoff. Good liftoff. Automatic. To the recorded strains of Off We Go Into the Wild Blue Yonder, Scott and Irwin streak toward a lunar rendezvous with Al Warden, who completes the all-Air Force astronaut team. Man has crossed yet another frontier in the exploration of our universe, but new horizons still wait to be crossed and conquered. For in the words of Robert Hutchings Goddard, there can be no thought of finishing. No matter how much progress one makes, there is always the thrill of just beginning. This edition of the Screen News Digest has been brought to you as a public service by the First National Bank of Minneapolis.